Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on the topic of DCD heart recovery and transplantation, the UK experience. We're very excited to have speakers from the UK, and we thank you for your patience as we were ironing out um, a little bit of the connections um, between the UK and here. Um, hopefully, all will go well with the technology, and we thank you uh, for joining us today, and we are very excited to hear from our speakers, and they will be introduced shortly. I just have a few opening points, uh, slides to go through, and then I will turn it over to our moderator. My name is Heidi Aguiar, and I'm part of the Alliance team. So uh, just for purposes of navigating this platform, for those of you who are participants, um, if you have a question, the bottom left-hand corner you see a blue icon, a chat icon. Just click on that and type in your question, and we will be able to take your questions from there. I also wanted to announce that a week from today, we have a webinar on the topic of tissue and cornea donation from Recovery and Beyond. Um, registration is still open for that, so please join us as well for that webinar. Now for today's webinar, because it is a 90-minute webinar, we are actually offering 1.5 SEPC credits, and also we are offering 1.8 nursing contact hours uh, courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. So if you are listening today, you are entitled to your continuing education certificates. For those of you who registered for the webinar today, you will be the one that will be receiving the evaluation email. So please make sure to forward that email to everybody in the group that is with you so everyone can complete the evaluation and receive the, the certificates. Please just note that for the SEPC, so you have 30 days turnaround, but for nursing, you only have 14 days, and that's 14 days, not 14 business days. So at this point, I would like to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator is Wade Liu. He's part of our Innovation Webinar faculty and also a member of our Leadership and Innovation Council, and he's the Vice President of Product Development at Transplant Connect. And Wade, I will turn it to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Hedy. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. As Hedy mentions, my name is Wade Liu. I'm the Vice President of Product Development here at Transplant Connect, and I have the absolute honor of introducing three very distinguished speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker is Anthony J. Clarkson. Anthony, Anthony qualified as a registered nurse in 1994, specializing in head and neck surgery. In 1997, he moved to work in a national blood service, initially in blood and, tissue, blood and live tissue donation. In 2000, he expanded his role to include deceased tissue donation, traveling to the USA to become a certified tissue banking specialist. In 2005, he took on a national role managing all aspects of tissue donation and the professional leadership for the UK eye retrieval scheme. Gaining an MSc in management development, he went on to become the head of clinical development before taking up his current post as assistant director for organ donation in 2009. As assistant director for organ donation and nursing, Anthony manages the 12 regional teams of specialist nurses in organ donation who facilitate deceased organ donation across the UK. In 2013, organ donation achieved its target of a 50% increase in deceased donor rates and is now working to implement the strategy set out in taking organ transplantation to 2020, which seeks to build upon the landmark success and save and improve even more lives. Our second speaker today is Marion Ryan. Marion qualified as a registered nurse in 1989. Following a period working in Australia in 1992, she returned to the UK and specialized in intensive care nursing. Marion worked as a senior nurse in a busy London hospital specializing in trauma and cardiothoracic critical care before joining the transplant teams at Papworth and Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge as a donor transplant coordinator in 1997. In 2006, she took the role of team manager for the Eastern Donor Transplant Coordinator Team. Marion has been in her current post in NHS Blood and Transplant as a regional manager since 2012, and she has management and operational responsibility for three regional specialist nurse teams in London, Southeast, and Eastern. And rounding out our speakers today is Mr. Stephen Large. Um, we're gonna learn a lot of things today. Uh, and perhaps one of the first things we'll learn is that uh, for us, those of us stateside, um, in the UK, uh, surgeons and medical providers are actually referred to as Mr. rather than Dr. 
So Stephen was appointed to Papworth Hospital in 1989 with a specialist interest in surgery for ventricular tachycardia. His early interest in medical student education led to Cambridge University appointment as associate lecturer in the Department of Medicine and on to become clinical subdean for cardiac and thoracic services. He was awarded the Diploma of Physician as Educator, RCP, by the Royal College of Physicians in 2001 after becoming a fellow five years earlier. He ran the heart transplant service from appointment to the end of 2008, developing the National Mechanical Heart Assist Program in 2001 through his particular interest in the failing human heart. His research interest lies in this area and his team are pursuing the possibilities of expanding the human donor heart pool through collaboration with the clinical transplant team in Cambridge, Stanford University, California, and the Canadian Research Center in Winnipeg. An additional fascination with management led him to achieve an MBA through the Open University in 2000 and to chair the cardiac directorate for five years until 2007. He now represents a specialty on the Interventional Advisory Committee of NICE, the HTA Interventional Committee, and is lead investigator of HTA Observational Study, ETTAA, five years from July 2013 at a value of <laughs> one point million pounds. So with that all said, uh, some very impressive speakers as I mentioned. Um, I'm very honored to pass it on to Anthony to kick off the presentation. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. Uh, my, uh, my role here is to give a background to organ donation and transplantation in the UK before we move on to the specifics around DCD heart donation. So I'll take you through a series of slides that hopefully will give you the right background and information required. Just to set the scene, um, the UK, in, the, in the UK, um, we have a population of, um, of 65 million. Um, we've got four nations of the UK, so two kingdoms, Scotland and England, uh, Principality of Wales and the uh, province of Northern Ireland. And we have three laws in the UK. So in uh, Northern Ireland and England, it's the same legislation, which is an opt-in legislation. Scotland also has a legislation which is opt-in. And Wales has a legislation which is the newest legislation, which is an opt-out legislation, where they presume consent uh, approach in, in, in Wales. The, so let me just move you to the next slide. Uh, an average around three people a day die in the UK uh, waiting for an organ transplant, and there's just over 7,000 people on the waiting list. We have a third, about a third of the population on the organ donor register, so just over 22 million. And surveys show, as with many other countries, that the vast majority of the population, around 90%, support organ donation. Our story began back in 1994, where we set up the organ donor register, and this was really to promote uh, organ donation, and it was a publicity drive uh, to have the register. Over the years, it's now converted into legal consent for, for organ donation. In 2001, we did set up a, a, a what was called then the non-heart beating organ donation program, DCD program, for both uncontrolled and controlled. However, those programs were, um, were, were short-lived and uh, hit many barriers on the way. Um, and in 2003, we set up what we have as a potential donor audit, uh, which back then was an audit just of uh, intensive cares across the United Kingdom, and the audit audit stole deaths to see what the don donation potential was from those patients. We've currently expanded that, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. We also introduced uh, what were donor liaison nurses. These were essentially in-house coordinators and they specialized in the donation side of the, uh, of the process. The, the coordinators at the time were dual uh, coordinators who had a donor role and a transplant role. Donation rates were struggling at this point, um, and the government decided to set up a task force. Um, this was around 2006. Um, to look at what we could do to improve donation rates in the UK. And the task force reported two years later in 2008 and was fully accepted by the four UK health departments. It had 14 recommendations, and those recommendations really covered areas such as donor identification and referral, the coordination, so the donor coordination function, and organ retrieval. It came with uh, financial support to implement the recommendations but it had a heavy target of 50% increase in five years. In order to achieve this, we set up um, a system of 
12 regional teams across the UK, um, one in Northern Ireland and Scotland, and then the rest split across England and Wales. And those regions were really covered um, for geographical distances as well as population. 250 uh, coordinators, donor coordinators, we now call specialist nurses for organ donation, uh, cover the whole of the UK and are geographically based. But I have an embedded role, which means that they undertake hospital development in one of 300 hospitals that have donation potential in the UK. They undertake donor facilitation on a 24-hour uh, basis, so they, they have an on-call system for 24-hour on-call. Uh, but the day job is doing hospital development. We also implemented clinical leave for organ donation. So each hospital of the 300 hospitals has a doctor, either an ITU doctor or an ED doctor, where we, we pay for half a day a week um, to concentrate on donation issues. And the uh, hospitals also have a donation committee. And this is a committee that is uh, chaired by an independent person, either a non-exec director, or may, may even be a family, donor family representative, who uh, ensure that all the systems are in place and, and governance is in place for organ donation uh, within the hospital. The task force also said that we needed to implement DCD as well as DBD across the whole of the UK and throughout the life of the task force we ensured that all 300 hospitals had a DCD program in place. We then went on to implement uh, a new retrieval system. Yeah. The system that was recommended was that we had seven abdominal teams and six cardiothoracic teams. These teams are dedicated to organ donation, but they're not actually employed by us as the OPO, and they're still employed by the transplant centers, but we commission them and fund them to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they're part of the transplant center, so they have surgeons that also participate in, in, in the transplant service. They are geographically placed um, to provide the relevant cover, and they both retrieve from DBD and DCD. The increase that was required, 50% increase, was actually achieved. Um, that was achieved virtually to the day of the five years, uh, and we got the 50% increase, which was uh, a great achievement for us in the UK. Um, and from that, we then needed to develop a new strategy. We did so um, by projecting our targets all the way up to 2020. And as you can see on this slide, um, we set us quite a heavy target, which was almost a 100% increase from our base year of 2006-07. We, we recognized the achievement of 50% increase, but there was still much more to do. And there were six areas that were identified that we needed to do further work on. Those six areas were classed as six big wins. And within those, we had, um, we had consent and authorization, Consent rates uh, in the UK had remained static at about 60%, and we'd really struggled to increase that, so we needed to do additional work in that area. Brain stem death testing was still very, um, was still very ad hoc in its approach, and, very, and, and the consent rate from team to team also varied significantly. We needed to put standardization in for DCD donation, and emergency donation from the emergency department was also in its infancy, but we'd recognized through our audits, which we'd increased to audit uh, deceased donors, potential deceased donors from the ED department, that there was an untapped pool in the emergency department. We also in wanted to introduce a referral criteria. Referrals for DBD um, were very good and remain very good at uh, well over 90%, but for DCD it was much lower, and at the time it was around 40% were being referred, and there was significant unmissed potential in the, in the unreferred pool. And the final area that we wanted to look at was donor, donor management, donor optimization to optimize the number of organs available for transplantation. The strategy that we introduced at that point was um, the Taking Organs 2020 strategy. And that strategy had the aim of increasing organ donation uh, to ensure it was world class with a target of 26 donors per million. It had four main pillars. Uh, within the strategy. The first one was increasing uh, support for donation within the, 
within the community. So this was essentially focusing on the consent rate and it was asking the population of the UK to support organ donation so we could increase our consent rate up to 80%. The second one was uh, focusing on hospital care. Um, we recognised and our evidence showed that where excellent hospital care had been given, then we were more likely to increase our chances of, of the family supporting donation. The third area was uh, an area uh, with hospitals to support and increase the use of organs available for transplantation. So this was around uh, donor optimization. It was working with our partners to ensure that we could put systems in place to look at machine perfusion. And the final area was the infrastructure. Uh, so this was, again, looking at our IT systems. It was also looking at uh, optimizing transplant capacity, recognizing that the increase in donation also needed to be matched on the transplant side. The targets that were set within the new uh, strategy was, as I said, a consent rate of 80%, uh, a significant shift currently to around 63%. It was to get us to world class. At the time, we recognized world class as being 26 donors per million, with an, an increased organ utilization rate of 5% and transplant rate of 74 uh, transplants per million population. For those of you that might be interested in some of the data, uh, around uh, the services in the UK. I'll just show you a couple of slides around that. So this has shown the increase in, uh, in, in our donation and transplantation rates. So we continued to increase uh, nicely since the task force um, was implemented in 2008-9. And then we had a slight dip at the end of, the, uh, of that strategy before we introduced the new strategy. Um, but we've continued to increase our, our donation rates again this year and we're likely to be on target this year for around 1,400 or just over 1,400. These are fiscal years, so they go from April to April. This slide just shows you the DBD and DCD and the total donations. Go back to it. Um, and as you'll see, the majority of the increase in the UK has been in DCD donation. And we've increased slightly in DBD, and but that's uh, that's plateaued uh, since about 2013. But we've seen a further increase in DCD, and in fact, in DCD donation, we actually can send more DCD donors than we do DBD. It's just that, the, as you would, uh, as you're fully aware, the actual conversion rate of, of DCD donors is much less. So therefore, we lose around half of those donors that we uh, initially approach uh, due to prolonged time to asystole and the acceptance of the organs. The next slide just shows the consent rate across the UK. I thought you might be interested to see again that DBD and DCD consent rates vary. I know that's similar in areas of the States and in Europe. Um, but everywhere in the UK, other than in uh, London, the DCD rate is lower than DBD. And in some areas, it's significantly lower. So we're already achieving our 8% consent rate in some areas of the UK for DBD, but we're much uh, further away from that in relation to DCD. And this is an area we've tried to focus on in the new strategy. Also, just like in the rest of Europe and uh, probably in the States too, you'll see that the age profile of our donors has changed over the years and our donors are, getting, uh, are certainly getting older. Um, and um, one would consider more marginal donors too, and particularly into DCD, uh, which has challenged the use of organs from DCD donors. Uh, but nevertheless, we're still seeing a significant increase. Just to close off that final couple of slides from this section, and uh, this shows your regional variation in donors per million population. So on the whole, the reasons for this variation is due to the hospital systems that are in place in these regions. So the northeast here has a very high um, per million population of donors. And compared to other regions, and one of the reasons for that is it's got two main donating hospitals with uh, a number of tertiary hospitals that refer into into those units. So the majority of the donors, the vast majority of the donors, come from two centres, uh, and it's a very stable uh, regional area, uh, and they seem to have increased their donation rates steadily over the last decade. Uh, Northern Ireland has also been successful, but again a very stable population, uh, with one primary um, major. Trom Hospital in, in Northern Ireland. The other areas <coughs> have not consolidated their, 
their services in the same way uh, and it's clearly been more difficult for us to to uh, increase donation rates in those areas. So the final slide on the data is just to show you that uh, it's pleasing to note that the old work has been reasonably successful in reducing the um, number of patients on the waiting list and that's steadily been coming down since about 2010 um, whilst we've seen an increase in, uh, in, in transplantation rates. Not the transplantation rate hasn't increased as much as the donor rate, it's 48% uh, there as you can see, um, but nevertheless it's having an impact on the, on the transplant weight waiting list. This is primarily kidneys that have um, that kidney transplants that have increased and therefore reduced the waiting list. Um, the area that we have struggled with has been heart transplantation um, and heart <laughs> transplantation rates have not increased in the same way. Um, therefore what we were very keen when the opportunity arose for us to, to pilot the DCD heart donation and transplantation program and for us to get involved in that. Um, and it's, it, I'm delighted to be handing over to Marin who will introduce how we went about um, taking that service forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so, and um, thank you all for, very much for the opportunity um, to share with you um, some of the operational considerations um, for implementing a, a successful ECD heart transplant program in the UK. Um, it has been quite a long journey, um, not as long for me as it has been for Mr. Large, but um, but we have shared we have shared the journey over the last decade with him. Um, and I hope that um, that we'll be able to demonstrate to you today that we have implemented an innovative and exciting DCD heart transplant program. Um, so I'll try not to repeat too much of the background that Anthony's um, already provided for us, but um, it, it, as is similar um, in pretty much around the world, um, demand for heart transplantation has never been greater in the UK. However, only about 8 out of 10 patients listed um, for a heart transplant will actually receive an organ donor. And as we've seen from the data that Anthony's provided, um, the number of potential DVD donors in the UK remains relatively static, um, and DCD donation has now become um, the most common organ donation pathway um, in the UK and continues to grow. Um, over the last decade or so in the UK, um, DCD donation has been hugely successful, increasing to what's actually, uh, my slide says eight, but it's actually around nine donors um, per million population, DCD donors per million population. Um, and DCD organ donors have been um, increasingly and very successfully used um, by abdominal and lung transplant programs with um, pretty excellent outcomes. Um, and he's also mentioned that the consent for DCD organ donation, um, it has increased slightly um, over recent years, but currently remains lower than that for DVD donation. Um, so there is room for improvement. However, also, um, as has already been said, there are some areas in the country that do buck the trend um, in, in sort of DVD versus DCD consent rates. One of those areas is London and also now the South East region um, in recent months have also increased their DCD consent rates and they're quite comparable to and, um, and also exceeding those of the DBD um, process. So I think in the UK we have some evidence that there is, some, there is potential for the further development of DCD donation. So... Um, the question that we all ask ourselves is why we find ourselves in this predicament of declining number of um, heart donors available for transplantation. And as with most things, it's a combination of reasons and factors. But amongst those are you know, improvements in primary health care, um, which has contributed to the increase in the average age of donors um, that Anthony's um, already alluded to <coughs> earlier. Similar reasons um, for the growing number of patients that are requiring heart transplants who, um, you know, just an aging population, better primary health care. And there's also been significant advances, as you're all aware, in the management of end-stage heart failure. And this has led to an increase in the number of patients that are, being, are, are eligible for listing for heart transplant. And also, we've seen um, vastly improved road safety and advances in the treatment of patients with devastating brain injury, which also means that our donor pool has 
our DVD donor pool has contracted significantly over the last couple of decades. So uh, the risk of um, repeating what's already been said, um, you, this slide just demonstrates the you know the number of um, the number of DCD, how, how DCD donation has expanded in the UK and account now accounts for a very high percentage of the um, total deceased donor population. So, to balance the limited supply of donated hearts and the increase in demand, um, alternative approaches were obviously needed to be investigated and explored as a matter of some urgency. And there have been a number of strategies that have been implemented over recent years um, with varying impact. Um, we've introduced um, scout programs um, in the UK where um, clinicians will uh, mobilise to a donor in advance of the retrieval team. And the purpose of that was then to, um, to optimise the donors and to maximise organ utility. And there, has, there, there is some evidence there has been some modest um, increase in heart donation as a result of this. Um, we've also introduced donor care bundles um, a number of years ago, um, and again, this would, um, it, these were introduced to, um, to improve donor management and optimisation. Um, and most recently, we've, in, we've introduced um, specialist requester roles in, um, in four, five um, regional areas within the UK, um, and, and I believe, I understand that there are similar roles within the US and the, the, the model that, we, that we've implemented does um, share, you know, there are some, um, some comparable components. Um, and it's still early days, um, but we're seeing some fairly positive results from the implementation of those roles. However, another solution was to take advantage of the increasing DCD donor pool. And Mr. Large and his team at Papworth and also a team at Harefield have been working for a number of years to develop a program to facilitate heart donation from DCD donors. Um, I've got a picture of Mr. Large here. Um, I don't normally have pictures of transplant surgeons in my, um, in my presentations. However, the name Stephen Large is synonymous with DCD heart transplantation um, in the UK at the moment, so I thought it was quite appropriate. He doesn't have a photograph of me or my team in his presentation, I've looked, so um, perhaps he'll rectify that in the future. So um, some of the, I just thought it would be worth going through some of the key steps that we went through um, in, in this journey with Mr. Large and his team. And it was about 10 or 12 years ago, and I'm sure Mr. Large will tell us exactly when, um, when he presents to us, that um, he pitched, basically, his, um, his vision for DCD um, heart donation in the UK. This um, presentation was delivered to transplant clinicians, transplant nurses, and transplant coordinators, um, in, it, it, primarily in the eastern part of um, the UK, where at that time we already had a really healthy and robust abdominal DCD heart transplant, um, DCD abdominal transplant program. So there was. Um, it, his presentation was met with quite a lot of scepticism, um, I have to be honest and say, um, and, and obviously they didn't, you know, there was, um, there was no appetite for the already successful program to be jeopardised by the introduction of um, a DCD heart. However, um, the team at Papworth were persistent um, and they, um, they proceeded to, um, to, you know, they, they, they they proceeded to um, to explore this as an option. So they sought and were authorised um, legal and ethical permissions um, to um, to investigate a DCD heart um, program in two regional hospitals in the eastern region, which had particularly high DCD donation rates, um, and as well as at Papworth Hospital as a study centre. Um, Protocols were also approved by various national committees and organisations, including the National Organ Donation Committee, um, the National Retrieval Group, and the UK Donation Ethics Committee. Um, with all of these permissions and, um, and protocols in place and approved, we then embarked on a fairly extensive education um, for hospital staff, for, for clinicians, nurses, coordinators, um, and I, in my next slide, I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, so a, um, 
with when, once all the um, the I's were dotted and the T's crossed, the study entered the next phase to establish the feasibility of the retrieval technique. And uh, Mr. Large's team undertook a number of DCD heart retrievals, um, primarily in one large donating hospital in the East of Region, which happened to be Adam Brooks Hospital. Um, and that proceeded over a couple of years without too many hiccups, to be perfectly honest. And following the successful com completion of that feasibility study phase, the program was extended to clinical transplantation of DCD hearts in March 2015. Um, now, I realise that sounds really simple and, um, and, and quite straightforward, but I, I probably have oversimplified it because that really did take us 10 years to get from the pitch to the actual clinical phase of retrieving and transplanting um, hearts. Um, so we're currently in the evaluation and development phase of um, of the program at the moment, and in 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 the process of expanding the um, the retrievals and the to several other areas within the UK. So currently, so we started off um, offering the um, DCDs DCD hearts in three hospitals in one region. We then expanded it to all 20 hospitals in that region, um, and then then for the last 18 months, there have been three regions within the UK offering DCD heart donation and, um, and a, a fourth centre region has just come on board quite recently. So, and so I said I'd come back to the education and training. Um, it was very much um, a, a collaborative um, and multidisciplinary approach to the training for, um, for the DCD heart programme. Um, initially, obviously, the transplant teams um, the, the transplant teams um, informed um, the specialist nurses and the clinical leads um, of the, um, the, the process that we were going to go through. Um, and then this training was then cascaded um, primarily by the specialist nurse teams to um, nursing staff, medical staff, um, and just about anybody really who was, who was going to be involved in a DCD process. Um, there was also lots of training and education for the other retrieval teams um, that, that primarily sort of the, the, the cardiothoracic team um, took responsibility for that. Um, each of the regions in, in the UK have me regular meetings where um, we have clinical leads for organ donation, we have transplant surgeons, clinicians, transplant nurses, um, organ donation committee chairs, um, and, and all interested parties from all hospitals that meet on uh, twice a year. And Mr. Large and his team presented regularly over several years at those meetings with progress um, of, the, um, of, the, of the program that he was um, proposing. And with that, with, there was an increased um, amount of anticipation and um, an eagerness, actually, to, to, to get the, the program up and running. Um, there was quite a lot of local training um, and awareness for hospital staff. Some of the hospitals um, that we, you know, that we cover it in our in the in in our regions may only see two or three donors a year. Um, so, and just educating staff about what would happen um, on the odd occasion where we might um, have a DCD heart was quite challenging. So, the specialist nurses. Um, who had responsibility for that, they would do primarily, they, they would do lots of education, but they actually did quite a lot of training at the time of referral. So once we've got people to refer patients, um, the specialist nurses would do some on-site training with, with the staff in theatres, in the ITU, and just anybody who was going to come into contact, really. Um, we also had um, communication from our clinical lead in organ donation, um, so Mr. Paul, Dr. Paul Murphy, who is the National Clinical Lead for Organ Donation, he wrote to all of the um, all of the hospitals in all of the regions that were um, were going to be involved in the program to um, to a introduce it to them and b get their approval um, for us to for, for their hospital to take part in the program. Um, and I'm pleased to say that. Without exception, um, all of our all of the hospitals uh, responded positively and wanted to take part um, in DCD heart referrals. 
Um, and we also set up a national DCD Heart steer, Steering Group um, to um, to support and oversee the program. Um, and that group um, meets fairly regularly, um, and all DCD Heart activity is reported to them. Um, any issues are reported to them, and we debrief um, about all of the all of the donation activity. Um, so just so that we can. Um, avoid any issues or complications um, and nip things in the bud really quite quickly. Um, I should have probably said right at the beginning that what we've identified, um, re what we identified very early um, is that clear and frequent communication between all of the parties um, involved in the process is absolutely essential. Um, and if at any point, you know, a, a small part of that communication breaks down, um, th then we do run into problems. So it's so, it's so, but it's as with all, you know, all things in donation and transplantation. But we found that it has been really, really, um, really vitally important. Um, so I spoke to I saw one of the team. I was, I was actually at a team meeting at the Eastern team um, today, and. Um, to, to, and I asked the nurses, the specialist nurses there, who've been really um, active in the programme, if they, if there was any messages that they would like, you know, they would share with you about the implementing of the um, of the programme. And they really, you know, the, the only things that they said that were really important was that preparation and communication um, were, were absolutely key, and the education for um, for the for all of the clips critical care areas um, was important, and also to have post-donation debriefs, um, which we've done um, post-donate of all of the um, all of the donations that have taken place. We've debriefed locally um, quite thoroughly, um, so um, so that we you know so we can build up um, a picture. Um, so some of the additional specialist nurse responsibilities that we've identified, other than just the generally sort of facilitating the donor um, are, you know, that in this, the it's important that um, when the potential donor is identified, they'll be assessed by the specialist nurse for suitability to be included. Um, so broadly, the inclusion um, if a DCD Heart Program is Maastricht three and four donors aged between 16 and 60 years, and this varies slightly um, from between Harefield, Papworth, and now Withenshaw who is the third transplant team to come on board. Um, there are some exclusions um, and previous cardiac surgery, known cardiac disease and previous MIs um, are amongst those um, exclusions. Um, other than that, each individual case would then be discussed with the transplant team to ensure the suitability and that resources are available for, um, for the team to attend the retrieval. Um, and we, we aim to we aim to to contact the team the transplant team prior to we even approaching the family about consent just in case it's not something that we can offer on this occasion. Some families have already consented; they offer consent, and um, so it's not always possible. We do always try to. Um, obviously, the specialist nurses obtain consent um, for, um, for for the donation, and. In gen generally speaking, this is exactly the same as for any other donor, um, I'd be, you know, be it DVD or DCD. Um, what I haven't mentioned yet is there are two, um, there are two retrieval methods um, for DCD heart retrieval, and I'm going to leave it to Mr. Large to explain both of those two, which I'm sure he's going to do. But one of the retrieval methods is um, is normothermic regional perfusion. And the only th the only difference from our um, obtaining consent is that when we use um, NRP, the normothermic regional perfusion, the heart is restarted in situ, and so it's really important um, that specialist nurses do explain this to the family. And this is this has been a stipulation um, that families um, must be made aware of of that that nuance to um, to DCD heart retrieval. Um, um, and I won't, you know, I'll be honest with you, that did cause some anxiety um, amongst um, a number of people at the beginning. Um, however, um, the specialist nurses have been very comfortable with it. We've had no um, negative responses from families, and it's done very sensitively, and the um, families and the, and the medical staff are given reassurances um, that, you know, that, that, that 
<clears throat> even if the heart's restarted in situ, there'll be no cerebral reperfusion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have not. Um, so whilst there were some scepticism about it and some reservations, it has not become a problem. Um, the specialist nurses, as I said before, communication cascade is is, is vitally important, and they are. Um, they're responsible for clear and frequent communication to just about anybody, really. Um, so they make sure that all, you know, that the abdominal centres know that there's going to be a heart team involved, that the heart team know ha which abdominal centres are going to be um, involved, and that there are no surprises for anybody um, when they turn up in theatres or at the donor hospital. And then, other than that, we just facilitate the donation as usual. Um, and 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 that's also one of the messages from from the from the Snod teams is that this is a donor and this is a donor as normal. Um, there are a couple of other considerations. Um, it, within it's within some areas within the UK, the location of treatment withdrawal. Um, it might sometimes it might be in the intensive care unit, and sometimes it was in the theatre suite. Um, in order for us to be able to facilitate DCD donation, and actually preference for the liver um, retrieval teams is that um, treatment, the, the location of the treatment withdrawal is in the theatre suite. So in some hospitals, we had to negotiate um, that we that that was the default position and that we would um we would withdraw, withdraw treatment in the theatre suite again that hasn't been a problem um, and we've been able to facilitate that on all occasions the end apart from that one change of location of treatment withdrawal the end of life care um and the um the, the withdrawal of treatment will not be changed in any way to facilitate donation um we've also um in for, for normal PCD donation, we would never have um, requested an echo, um, and this is now something that we um, that, that is required by the um, the transplant teams prior to accepting um, the heart. Um, some teams will come out, and if, if we're unable to um, facilitate that, as we're not able to in some hospitals overnight, um, the teams can come out and do that themselves. And the other things that we prepared ourselves for initially was um, was, was media interest. In actual fact, there wasn't a vast amount. Of, there wasn't. Um, there was lots of medium interest, but it wasn't as intrusive as we anticipated that it potentially could have been. Um, and all of the media interest there was um, was very much surrounding the transplant recipients, um, and was very very positive. Um, so any anxieties that we had were were completely unfounded. Um, so as I said, we do debrief all of the. Um, the donation um, episodes, of which there have been over 40 now um, in the last couple of years. Um, so some of the sort of the family and hospital staff reactions, um, the um, hospital staff expressed concerns that the, the process would be prolonged um, due to the DCD heart um, retrieval process, and, and, and it, it, it is. It is prolonged by a couple of hours. However, um, you know, I think um, so long as we manage people's expectations um, and we're realistic at the beginning of the process, that hasn't actually hindered um, the, the program at all, really. Um, some staff felt, said they felt uncomfortable um, and concerned about the explanations to the family, primarily around the restarting of the heart. Um, those those concerns were um, were voiced prior to the implementation um, of the programme, and we've not had any negative um, feedback at all um, about the explanations and the discussions um, with the families. Um, quite overwhelmingly, the responses that we had that they couldn't really understand why it hasn't happened before. Um, so a lot of a lot of the IT and theatre staff, um, some people didn't even know that it didn't happen. Um, let alone, um, you know, surprised it hadn't happened before. And certainly for donor families, um, m many families, w they wouldn't have known that it wasn't possible um, prior to um, a few years ago. So so we didn't have any negative um, feedback from that. Um, there was one nurse in a, in a hospital um, in one of our regions, and she did say that it was the most amazing thing that she'd seen in 23 years of nursing. Um, it's been a really positive experience for, um, for for most of the staff that have encountered it. It's been um, quite a 
tremendous um, learning um, environment for people. And the surgeons who have come out have have been brilliant at um, at, you know at at education and sharing um, the information and knowledge. Um, And just to note that 100% of families who consented to DC donation and were approached also gave consent for heart donation. So we haven't had a single family. to say no um, when approached about DCD hearts um, to date. Um, we've had um, really positive um, outcomes. Um, it's been, re- it's been you know, a hugely successful program. Um, and we've even had one donor, that, well, two donors now, actually, that the only organs that they could donate were their hearts. Um, so that was really positive for, for everybody involved, but in particular for the, for the donor families, um, who were obviously very positive um, about the organ donation, so we were able to facilitate their wishes. And um, so in, in summary, it's, um, this has been a hugely successful venture. Um, we've had significant stakeholder um, and staff engagement, which has resulted in enthusiastic support um, for, um, for the DCD heart donation. So far, there have been 32 DCD heart transplants that have been carried out at Papworth and Harefield Hospitals with outstanding outcomes that I know Mr. Large is going to um, share with you. Um, the evaluation um, is continuing um, and a business case for national implementation has been written. Um, we're very confident that many more lives will be saved and transformed with the continued support from donating hospitals and, um, and the generosity of donor families. Um, and I think, um, you know, obviously we're immensely grateful to everybody who's been involved. And, um, and there's been a real sense of pride and achievement in the teams and the hospitals um, that have been involved in this so far. So it's been, it's been um, fantastic in terms of um, motivation and, um, and support and enthusiasm for um, organ donation in the areas that we've already implemented it. And that's it. That was my simple version of DCD Hearts. Yes. I my internet connection's gone down, so I'm going to run my I'm going to run my slideshow here, and I'll be saying next slide and so on. I hope that that's going to be great. And thanks to 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 uh, both of our speakers for setting me up so very nicely, and thank you, thank you, Marion, for some very kind words there. I haven't actually got a photograph of you, but I have actually got huge acknowledgement of you. <laughs> So I'm going to begin. Here's my first slide, telling, sort of setting the scene. I'm, I'm a surgeon. I'm a very old surgeon now in, in Papworth, and I've been fascinated with heart failure for the 33 years that I've been practicing here. And uh, it's an extraordinary area. And this is uh, an introduction to a, a heart being readied for transplantation, a DBD, of course. And so the, the problem for the country is massive, just to put it in context for folk from abroad, you're about five to six times bigger than us, and we have 500,000 people living with heart failure. We just had a fabulous national uh, audit for heart failure, and it's, it emphasizes and underscores the enormity of the problem, and it costs about 2% two, 2% 2 of the gross national product for this country, and it involves folk with frequent admissions, 35% admissions with heart failure in New York Heart Association Classification 4, 40% of readmissions similarly categorized. And, and one good thing is that the inpatient mortality, that, sorry, the, the patient mortality has fallen in the last two years since the last audit from 11, just over 11% to just over 9%. So that's, that's very, very encouraging. And of course, heart failure is, becomes much more common as we get old, older. And so um, it's, uh, this whole concept of transplantation is not is not for all because it's really very well designed for people who have simple single organ failure and folk with com- comorbidity, in other words, failure of other organs. It's not so successful, but to all our surprise, it's and this is the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. This is a, sorry, big pardon. This is I said I was going to tell you when I was going to move slides, and I'm I'm not. This is a graph of the uh, entitled Adult and Pediatric Heart Transplantation, Kaplan-Meier Survival. We have an initial 
problem with survival early on in the first few weeks after transplantation associated essentially with the operation in a very, very sick person. But once we get beyond that, there's essentially a linear loss of folk, uh, about 3.5% per year, giving a conditional half-life of about 13 years. So a radical transformation of, as you probably all know, from uh, of, of, of survival compared to the survival with heart failure, but also a near, a near normalization of, of a quality of life. So it's, it is an extraordinary therapy. And um, with it, you can see on the next slide, which is entitled UK Heart Transplant Activity, and here, I'm sorry to be so parochial for, for the UK, but we've got very good data from our extraordinary uh, um, NHS and um, NHS Blood and Transplantation Authority. And here we see some relatively recent data showing in a black continuous line the number of, of, of patients awaiting transplantation on the waiting list. And you can see up until 2008 a pretty constant level, and that was my fault because I and a number of others in that era were very keen not to overload the waiting list with patients who were quite expensive to assess, who were probably never going to get transplanted. And very sensibly, on my retirement from that process in 2008, uh, the, those eligible for transplantation have all been placed on the list, and it continues to grow very rapidly. Happily with it, in blue, you see, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but you can see the, the change in the number of donors. Um, and the change in the transplant activity in grey. Um, I'm not quite sure why on occasions there are more, there are more transplants, transplants than there are donors, but that's probably a, uh, a national thing. You know, some, we're very big-hearted over here in Britain. And so if you look on the next slide, it's um, entitled NHSBT 2015, and this is donation and transplantation rates of organs from DBD donors uh, in the UK, 1st of April 2013 to 31st of March 2014. It sets the scene for the, the big mismatch that's happening now between organ supply um, and, and organ demand. And you can see here, in, um, as we go across organ donation, between kidney in red, liver in green, um, blue for pancreas, gray for bowel, and, uh, and gray with pink dots for lungs. And the one we're really interested in is pink with little crosses for hearts. And so of those, of those um, our donors, of all the donors, some 760 or so, um, we see that not all are eligible to give hearts. Give hearts. And, um, and then as we go through consent and we go through organs offered for donation, organs retrieved for, for donation, and then organs actually transplanted, we find that something like 31%, that sort of level, of hearts that are, uh, uh, that are donated are actually used in the transplant service. And so the, the probable demand is of the order of 750. They're very arguable. 750 potential transplants per year in our 63 million population. And we're, we're meeting something like 170 of those in the adult population. So a, a big shortfall. So we were, we were worrying about, about this. And if you look at further NHS figures here in the next slide, UK outcomes following listing. If we look at the latest data from NHS Blood and Transplantation Authority, we see the number, uh, we see the number of patients who were placed onto the list and reviewed um, back in, um, uh, for, for, sorry, for put on the list some three, um, some three and a half years ago, followed for three years, and how many uh, were, were transplanted uh, we see in black at six months, they're actually transplanted about 10%. And at 36 months, 20%. And uh, we see still waiting, um, 55%. Um, and at uh, six months, still waiting in, at 36 months, uh, uh, just merely 15%. Became urgent, we see us uh, uh, at six months, some moving forward to the urgent list, a new new venture for us. And uh, we see those urgently listed at, at 36 months, up at the level of 40%. Moving on to the next histogram, those removed from the list, some 6% at six months, some 12% at, uh, at 36 months, and those that died, some, some 7%, and those at 36 months, some 15%. Managed by moving 
moving, keeping that mortality low by moving to the urgent list, um, or to, of course, other um, uh, methods of managing heart failure. And here we look at the outcomes of, of listing onto the urgent list. And we get the same, same sort of color scheme. You know, how many transplanted? Well, 69%, um, 68% at six months, 69% at, at 36 months, three years, still waiting. We've got some, some 6 7% removed, 18%, 19% at uh, 36 months. Those died at the order of 10%. So quite what removed means is, is, is uh, an open question. So, uh, you know, a, a really sizable shortfall in providing for these very sick folk. So we, as we were cogitating, we, we looked at the, the next slide, which tells us from the 2016 report from our own NHS blood and transplantation. And here in gray, in light gray, we're looking at the number of DBD donors, not hugely changing, uh, with time, 2007 through to 2016, we look at the number of living donors, which, you know, I, <laughs> is not really an issue for heart transplantation. Though I have a number of colleagues who I would love to use as living donors. Um, that's a flippant remark, forgive me. And then in red, highlighted in red, are the number of DCD donors inexorably climbing. So we're, we asked the question very early on, actually back in 2000, and, well before 2006. Can we, can we do what our liver and kidney colleagues have done, which is to make full use of, of the generosity of, of patients who are suffering D, uh, DCD, circulatory determined death? And the first question was, really, you know, can the heart tolerate the ischemia that's associated with a heart coming to, an, um, coming to a halt and, and suffering a normothermic, 37-degree normothermic, anoxic period. So um, my PhD student, uh, Ayaz Ali, looked at a number of control rats um, suffering seven minutes of normothermic hypoxic um, uh, arrest. And there, shown in blue, is a, a rather complicated measure of, of contractility. It's called the end systolic pressure volume relationship. We, it, it's, it's, it's attained by um, Capital electrodes, little, little catheters in the, in the left ventricle, looking at instantaneous measurements of, of volume by an electrical method of conductance, and of course instantaneous pressure by direct solid state manometry. And then, if that's the situation before and after, um, before before uh, the the onset of ischemia and after ischemia, for seven minutes in blue, and then we did the same in, uh, for a number of rats, 30 minutes in black. Um, and really looking pretty respectable in terms of contractility. Take that experience out to 60 minutes, and we find that we're, we were really struggling to get any sort of contractility from the, the heavily insulted uh, rat heart at 60 minutes of normothermic and, uh, anoxia. So that's very much in keeping with, with work done in the 70s, a little bit of work by Jennings in the 80s in, um, in dog models, and uh, that's... Um, that sets the scene for us. So we have to move pretty quickly if we're going to get involved in trying to get hearts from um, circulatory determined death, which, of course, is quite simply a non-heart-beating donor. And so we, uh, in Canada, um, again from my, my PhD student, Ayaz Ali, poor chap, he had to spend a bit of time in Stanford and then do it with a rat heart model and then moving to Winnipeg in Canada, um, undertaking pig work and here we had the privilege of using a mass spectroscope and we could put the heart that was uh, there in control um, a control heart in black 15 minutes of normothermic arrest 60 minutes in, in red in green 60 minutes of reperfusion in and, and then 20 minutes of the heart supporting the circulation in purple and what we're really interested in is the fuel gauge because you just sort of following the analogy of your car, there's a great machine, but it won't work if you haven't got fuel. And the whole thing probably is nothing more or less than the availability of fuel in the form of high-energy phosphate bonds. So here we've got P PCR, phosphocreatine, and we've got PI, inorganic phosphate, and ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And there you see in black the three big peaks of phosphate. And um, 
what we see with uh, 15 minutes of arrest, you can see in red, is a massive increase of the, of the free phosphates, uh, a huge drop in red of the phosphocreatine, and the loss of the three peaks, pretty much the total loss of the three peaks of adenosine triphosphate. But with gr in green, in 60 minutes of reperfusion, we've got an improvement, a considerable improvement in phosphocreatine. Our inorga in inorganic phosphate is disappearing and being used, implemented into adenosine to form the triphosphates again. And within 20 minutes of being off pump, we've got pretty much normalization of phosphocreatine and our adenosine level. So we were encouraged by that and thought this was a good thing to do. We modeled heart transplantation either from DCD, circulatory determined death, and non-heart beating donors with a 15-minute standby, or brainstem death with catheters inside the skull and creating um, an intracranial hypertension. And here you can see these pressure volume loops that we've got from the fancy machine I was telling you. And the left ventricular um, pressure volume loops show pretty respectable changes. I'm sorry, this is probably the first time you've ever seen this, but there we see the end systolic pressure volume relationship looking pretty respectable for for DCD hearts, not so great for brainstem dead hearts, and the diastolic function on the bottom of the slice of bread looking looking not too bad for both. Look at the right ventricle, and you see a really ropey heart struggling with brainstem death. It's a it's an acute model of both. Um, it's a severe model of brainstem death in the pig, and uh, and also for DCD. But we got pretty good results from the the right heart. So again, we were well encouraged with with um, with our, our large animal work. And then we said, well, what about the poor little myocytes? You know, um, if if we take our little little myocyte, how does it contract? And there, in the next slide, which this is called contractile reserve in isolated cardiomyocytes after isopressorenal uh, administration, brainstem death, death versus 15 minutes of, of non-heart beating donation or DCD. You can see the control in the first one showing the sort of normal contractility of, an, of, of a, uh, an, uh, an isomere, and then control plus, plus um, um, isopressorenal, also stimulating it, pretty, pretty dramatic um, catechonian response. And after brainstem death, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a reduced, a much reduced uh, sarcomeric contraction and a, a correspondingly reduced um, inotrope response. DCD described as DD15 and DD15 plus ISO, showing a pretty much normal contractility of the isomeric um, of the isomere with uh, a very nice contractile reserve. So again, we were impressed. So the, the heart's looking good at a macroscopic level. It's looking pretty good at microscopic level. And uh, then we went on and said, look, is there much damage? There's, a, of course, the familiar leaked, leaked protein troponin I from, um, from damaged myocytes. And in the next slide, you'll see this is called uh, the recovered study one, the recovered one study. Um, hearts from DCD donors displaying acceptable biventricular function, et cetera. You can see the control uh, is a pretty low level of troponin and I leaked from good cells, well-nourished cells in our control hearts. Brain death, BD, uh, we've got a troponin regarded, uh, described as two. Um, DCD, standby for 15 minutes, probably much the same range, not significantly different from brain death at about two and a half go to 30 minutes of, um, of uh, normal thermic circulatory arrest, and it's not surprising to see a significantly different um, troponin rise to four of these particular particular units, nanograms per, per mil. So uh, certainly we're hurting the hearts, but um, it looked from our, our small animal work and our large animal work that things were looking pretty good. And in 2006, which we, uh, we, we, uh, we went to, Addenbrooke's Hospital, and with the permission from extraordinary support of a very far-seeing donor family, a 53-year-old lady who'd come in um, having had a spontaneous intracranial bleed, uh, offered the, the, their, their, their uh, mother's heart for research, and we used the process of normal thermic regional perfusion, which Marion's already hinted. Here we we um, opened the patient's chest, having told the the relatives exactly what we're going to do, and heparinize the patient, clamp the 
neck vessels, so there was going to be no question of cerebral perfusion for the simple reason we didn't want a very badly hurt brain plus the, the required uh, asystole and further normothermic insult of an arrested, arrested heart um, to, to cause swelling and herniation in the Cushing's response. So on the top line, you see the pressure volume loops that you're kind of getting used to now of the left ventricle looking very nice. This is patients going with triple vessel disease but seemingly normal left and right ventricles. And here are the pressure volume loops of the left ventricle on the top left, right ventricle on the top right. And in our donor, um, we, we found that with a normothermic regional perfusion, which essentially perfused the heart, the liver, the kidneys, and the various abdominal viscera, we see in that limited perfusion um, the heart possible to wean from, from the, the normothermic regional machine perfusion to have the heart support that, that limited area. And in black, we see the pressure volume loop looking a bit bigger and looking not as healthy as what, what we'd expect to be normal. And the right ventricle looking very, very square instead of that rather triangular position. Give it some inotrope and a very snappy response from the right ventricle, um, much more normal looking, small and, uh, and con contracting well, and similar sort of changes with increased contractility in the, in the left ventricle. So here we have an, a human picture of what, what it could be like to use DCD donors. So by now, 2006, we're very excited, and this is going in the right direction. We published this in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation, and there was a lot of concern about what we were doing. And we, we uh, it set up arguments as to, as to the appropriate recognition of death in the, um, the DCD or non-heart-beating donor, summarized beautifully by our own Academy of the Royal College of the Royal Colleges, and, uh, and guidelines published in 2012. And uh, the next slide shows us from the British Journal of Anesthesia this, the, the, um, the cause of death of uh, patients who are actual DCD donors. And you can see here that there's a great deal of emphasis on um, intracranial hemorrhage, hypoxic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, forming the vast majority. And so um, just looking in all, in all intents and purposes is a very attractive group for heart donation. So on to the next slide. My, my then new students, uh, PhD student Simon Messer, worked with NHSBT, uh, NHS Blood and Transplantation, uh, Transplantation Authority, to look at the potential um, for, of, of, for heart transplantation from this group of, of patients suffering uh, DCD death. And here we, over three years, Simon found that there were 3,073 at the time DCD donors. And he went through this, the, the, the steps of this algorithm. Did they consent, yes or no? Did they, were they under 50? We were being very draconian, uh, thinking about heart transplantation. Did they have cardiovascular risk factors? Were they on um, anotropes that would worry us? Was there incomplete data? Was the functional warm ischemic time, something that the liver, our liver transplantation colleagues had given us, um, the rather extraordinary issue of a systolic blood pressure of 50, which for a heart's perfused in diastole. So it's, it's there as a way mark, really, of, the, of the, the coming arrest. So a useful thing. Was that under 30 minutes, that functional warm ischemia? And if so, with this draconian uh, selection, we found that there was 5% of that, of those 3,073 DCD uh, donors that could potentially have offered a heart um, so it's about 50 extra hearts a year, and you'll say that's not much, but when our activity is 170, that's pretty impressive. So here I introduce you to the, the Code of Practice for Diagnosis and Confirmation of Death from the Academy of the Royal Colleges, a wonderful, a wonderful um, document put together by both the public and, uh, and professionals working uh, in a multidisciplinary group across the royal, all royal colleges here in the UK and allowing us, um, permitting the, the, the um, DCD practice. I've got here a, um, a video with a rather green hand, my hand, on one of our early cases. And you can see uh, in that picture there's a big cross diagonal which goes across the arch vessels of the aorta, thoracic aorta, ensuring no blood through and you either the blood or either no. the vertebral to the brain. So just, um, just have a selective perfusion of normal cellular regional perfusion of the heart and abdominal 
um, uh, abdominal viscera. I don't know if the I don't know if the video is going to work for you all, but if it does, you can see the abdominal yeah. surgeons working yeah. together with us. Okay. You can see the heart so regaining its, yeah. its, its function. You can see a transesophageal echo showing. And you the other veins. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You see the heart on the organ chest transmedic, and uh, and uh, you can see how there it is beating on a Langendorf mode that is perfused by the aortic root and, uh, and making functional studies rather difficult. And Marion told you that we need, we look forward to echo studies of the heart before withdrawal. And this is with, with, uh, with, with relative yeah, consent. Yeah, so we can have an idea that we've got normal so valvular function yeah. and normal biventricular function. If we're doing normal yeah, if you close the other pulmonary veins, normal yeah. 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 Doing, yeah. it gives us a chance to assess the heart as if it, the, the patient was a heart beating donor. And indeed, once we've got the heart moving with machine perfusion for about 25 minutes, we then find that the heart very easily takes over the circulation, the reduced circulation, perfusing both itself and the abdominal, uh, abdominal organs. And we can do formal assessments with transesophageal echo, and we can do formal assessments with pulmonary artery flotation catheters to study circulatory, circulatory output and, of course, filling pressures to left and right sides. So uh, uh, giving a little bit more confidence to the donor team so that they can convince the implant team that we've got a useful heart for transplantation. And, and so um, you're all very quiet, but I can just carry on. I hope I'm doing all right here. Um, I still have the connection. The, yes, the next slide, oh, good. The next slide is a gray slide saying donor, DPP, brackets 10 plus 3, and NRP 10. This was a summary slide of, of when the UK had done 23 um, DCD transplants. So it's a little old, so forgive me. We've um, collectively now done actually um, 27 at Papworth and 6 at Airfield. So that's actually 33 um, DCD transplants in the UK. Um, and I'll take you through the results. This is a slightly earlier experience. So the mean age of the donors, refreshingly young, and you in the States will say, not so, but for us, our donor age has been rising dramatically. And of course, there we see the male difference between direct procurement. That is where we, we take the heart straight off the out of the chest and put it directly onto the, the Langendorf perfusion rig, which I hope you saw um, in the video clip, um, or the pretty much equal number of patients who've come through normal thermic regional perfusion. The hearts have been perfused, basically, is what's happened two different ways of perfusing them. And the causes of death of the donors, you can see here cerebral uh, causes of death of uh, cerebral hypoxia uh, dominating and um, intracranial bleed for the normal thermic regional perfusion, hypoxia for the direct procurement. So we'll go on to the next one, functional assessment, which of course of the donor heart uh, as it's on the organ care system, uh, the Langendorf perfusion mode you'll see that we can only do the functional assessment in a, in a familiar way when we're doing normal thermic regional perfusion. You can see here we've got a cardiac index, which is probably actually unnaturally high. We've got a reduced circulation, so we're being a little mischievous. But anyway, it's good. Great cardiac output, great heart rate, which you'd expect from a neurologically dead patient. Very low filling pressures, which are wonderful to see. Mean arterial pressures that are, that are extremely impressive an ejection fraction of 65%, which is well within the normal range. The next slide takes us into how um, the uh, transmedics, the organ care system, uh, Langendorf uh, perfusion apparatus builders, tell us to assess the, the heart, and they, they're very concerned about lactates, circulating lactates. And here in this slide, we've divided the time course, at bottom left, to, to 120 minutes, bottom right um, for the duration of the hearts that how were taken by normothermic regional perfusion, that is mechanical loading and mechanical perfusion in the donor and then the, the donor heart supporting the circulation whilst we do the assessment. So during this time we've looked at lactates. Generally the lactates fall and you can see that those are the ones in red but the ones in black tend to go up and down and round and round and the reason we're interested in this is because Transmedics tells us that we should be watching the lactates 
and only when they're at a level of 5 millimoles per litre, here on the y-axis you can see 0 through to 20, so starting in some cases very high, uh, but generally trending down. Very occasionally we're getting to 5, and then of course we're on the organ care system out of the body, being perfused in Langendorf mode, and um, a great number of hearts, well above that five level. So had we had we stuck to the advice from Transmedics, uh, we didn't really believe them with this lactate level, and we um, we've we've transplanted all of these hearts with great success. So we're a little nervous about lactates as a way of selecting good and bad hearts. So the next uh, the next slide called timings, DPP and NRP shows us that the withdrawal of support, of life support, to asystole of the heart in the direct procurement group of 13 cases was 33 minutes. Um, and a pretty wide range, you can see plus or minus 53 minutes, so hugely wide range. And we will wait, we've, we've waited up to four hours and actually four minutes for our heart to arrest in, a DCD, in DCD donation. So well, it's all very new ground for us. And the NRP group, 25 minutes from uh, to arrest after withdrawal of therapy. But again, of course, with that characteristic wide range, plus or minus 39 minutes. Asystole, that is when the heart stops beating, we've lost the pulse, and at that point we start the clock running and we're advised that we need five minutes of standby before we can uh, declare death. And once we declare death, we move the patient um, from the room of withdrawal, so often the anesthetic room, but not always sometimes the intensive care unit, and then the patient comes into the operating room and the chest is opened, and um, we go through the either direct procurement, um, giving, giving uh, some cold to the heart as, as if it was a, a regular uh, transplant, and placing it swiftly onto the organ care um, normothermic perfusion rig, or the normothermic reperfusion where we went straight to, we went straight to perfusion in the donor, after clamping off the cerebral vessels. And you can see that there's a sizable um, reduction in the time from asystole to blood perfusion, um, saving some eight minutes. And it's, as you can ap appreciate how, with the sensitivity of the heart to normothermic anoxia, this is a terribly important time. So we're persuaded, we're persuaded that normothermic reperfusion has quite a lot to offer in that area. Not only, of course, perfusing all the other organs for transplantation, but reducing the, the time without a blood supply at normothermia. The next slide shows us the, um, the, the recipients and um, some of the characteristics. We purposefully chose patients with low transpulmonary pressure gradients um, on the recipient side, and uh, we tried to avoid in the early stages uh, involving complex patients with ventricular assist devices. Here in the direct procurement, we see um, 44% of the patients having ventricular assist devices and normothermic reperfusion, only 10%, quite by chance. The reason, the, the way we distributed these patients was, of course, by being licensed to, to uh, undertake normothermic regional perfusion in our own hospital, our sister hospital in Cambridge, Addenbrookes, and uh, another hospital in Norwich. So this is an activity from a very restricted area. So it's a, a, a rather strange distribution of cases but uh, it's, not, it's not medical selection, it's, it's, if you will, geographical. The next slide shows us the transplantation, the, uh, transplantation times. On the OCS, the organ care system, we trans transport the heart perfused on the transmedics organ care system. For direct procurement, of course, um, it's on much longer, um, inevitably from, from more distant parts, but also, of course, that, that includes the equivalent of time on the being perfused in the donor, um, which we see in NRP. So the NRP appropriately lower, uh, inevitably. The implant time is very swift, and we run retrograde um, cold blood through the coronary sinus to try and keep a, an energy supply to that heart because it's been through quite a bashing, as you can imagine, from, from all the insults it's had across the, the recent time. So uh, swift implantation, and then the outcomes we see in the next slide called post-op, DPP and NRP. Um, we find that in use of intraortic balloon pumps in about a fifth of patients, about one-tenth have required ECMO uh, support, and, um, and ventricular assist in one patient in 
that had direct procurement. The respiratory support uh, in the intensive care unit was pretty swift. Um, on average, uh, um, 4.7 for, for direct procurement and two, these are hours, sorry, for normothenic regional perfusion. First cutting index for what it's worth, of course, with anotropic support, um, pretty impressive in both direct procurement and normothenic regional perfusion. And um, the, um, the filling pressures on the left side is as a wedge shown there, 16 versus 12 between DPP and, and NRP. An ITU stay um, much reduced for, the, for this very small experience of NRP. So um, are we going in the right direction? We're not sure. We need, we're going to need much larger numbers because the standard error is really pretty impressive too before we start drawing any conclusions. And the follow-up tells us that our experience, about one in five patients fail to arrest uh, within four hours, which is our, our kind of agreed uh, standby time. We're getting a lot of pressure to actually move, move faster, so that's actually come down to three hours. And there's probably little merit in staying that extra hour in terms of, of return and occupation of theaters and all the facilities that are on offer. And of 24 hearts um, uh, that uh, we, 24 hearts, um, the next, sorry, the next slide shows 24 hearts of 25 taken on, on the OCS have been implanted. One turned down at the time of this experience um, because of concerns of, of, of uh, poor function seemingly on the OCS, a rising, dramatically rising lactate and even we got alarmed at that. The cumulative survival for this, this experience of 23 patients was um, 3,500 3, 3, days uh, from 21 to 451, uh, the equivalent of a nine-year, eight-month uh, human experience. So a pretty good exposure to early and mid survival after um, DCD transplantation. The next slide shows us that we had, we've had two acute rejection episodes um, one of which rather worryingly was humoral rejection. We, it's normally cellular rejection, and we see humoral from time to time. That it remains at one patient so far who's had that. We see it, as I say, from time to time. And uh, we've had two deaths, um, one from a, a patient whose heart was very hypertrophied and, um, and uh, had coronary disease leading to infarction. We don't, we, it's not easy to get... Um, coronary imaging in, uh, in these patients here in this country. It's not easy to get coronary imaging in any patients coming up for organ donation. Uh, you're very privileged in the States to have that. And so it's something I'm sure that we'll be developing as time goes by. Um, and so this is the sort of experience at 92% at 30 days and uh, much the same at, at um, one year. So very comparable, behaving very comparably to brainstem death transplantation. And so overall, uh, making a massive impact to our own heart transplant program. And, um, and uh, Harefield, uh, perhaps not um, our sister hospital, in, uh, uh, also in, the, in this venture, not undertaking more than six hearts to date in the two-year period we've been running. Um, so not quite such, an ex uh, such a, a dramatic increase in their, their experience. And we, as, as Marion said, Look, are looking forward to the third centre of the five centres in the UK, in, in, in England, uh, coming on board and seeing them incre uh, start their activity and increase their activity. So it looks as though it's got a very important role to play in providing what the, the long, the very patient patients on the waiting list are looking forward to. And uh, it may have some sidelong impact on heart failure in the future. And then as a present on the last slide, um, I'm sorry, this is a slide of, of some 10 people uh, last Christmas came to a drinks party to uh, celebrate the, the DCD program. 10 here of the, thir the then 13 patients. The other three were tied up, busy with other arrangements. But uh, the funders here at Papworth, some of the funders for our, our research work, and um, a sizable number of the team involved came to join these 10 characters who'd had their hearts transplanted by DCT donation. And it was a very, very moving experience, I have to say. Um, so this is really a reminder to tell us what it's all about. And here is my final slide that shows the 
huge number of people who've been involved and principally and most importantly is our first patient, Mr. Olucan, whose name he's very happy for me to use, had the courage to be the first recipient. And um, this has been, been received very well by patients on the list. And, um, and so many thanks to our, our, our team of uh, transplant coordinators. And um, you've heard um, Marin, Marin Ryan, who leads that team, and, of course, colleagues in, um, across the country, essentially through NHSBT. And my and past colleagues and Sir Peter Simpson, who chaired the Academy of the Royal, of the Royal College, so beautifully coming up with that life-saving guidance, which has been wonderful. So at that point, I'll, I'll stop and hope that the phone connection is enough to, to answer any questions that there may be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Large. Um, Large. We yeah. are. Uh, we are actually at the top of the hour, and so I just wanted to offer for everybody who has stayed on and um, joined us until this point, we understand if you need to jump off the call and um, attend to your your daily duties. But if you would like to stay on to con to ask questions, um, Mr. Large and uh, Marian and Anthony, are you available to stay on a little bit to finish answering some questions? Yes, of course. Wonderful. So if, if you all have to jump off, um, thank you very much. We do have some questions in the queue, so um, Wade, I will turn it to you to go through those questions. Great. Thank you, Hedy. Um, so the first question that we have in the queue was actually raised during, Anthony, your presentation, um, and it's asking, what is your upper age limit for DCD? For DCD generally, um, the upper age limit is 70. Uh, for DCD heart, what, what's the upper age limit, Stephen? We, we've, we've laid it down at 50, but we've had two patients who've donated at 54 and 57. So 50 is a sort of rough guideline, which we permit ourselves to break from time to time, depending on, the, on so many factors like the, the, uh, the um, comorbidities, you know, if the patient's not hypertensive, is not a smoker and so on. Yeah. We're, we're reasonably flexible even with the DCD um, upper age limit for, for other organs too, um, mm. but um, it, it depends on the suitability. Great, thank you. And on a related question, uh, another participant actually asked, what is the age of your youngest DCD heart donor so far? And what was the age of your oldest thus far? And will you venture into newborn heart donation? <laughs> this is coming my way. So our youngest, um, our youngest, oh, Marion will help me with that. We are, we're, we're dictated to by, I'm afraid, the grisly fact of the volume of blood that we require to prime the organ care system. So we need a fairly large donor. So it's not paradoxically the heart that's a problem, nor the ability of the OCS to pump, but a, a problem of the size of the prime now, we're working up to a program of pediatric donation, and what we're doing is to try and limit the circulating space within the OCS in conjunction working with transmedics. So we've got that down from 1.5 liters to about 800 cc's. So that means that we should be able to approach much younger, younger donors, probably down to the age of possibly eight, something like that. Um, so neonatal, not just yet. That's, that's a long way off. That's too small. And we're going to do some work on, we, we've got a problem with availability of appropriate blood. We use, reluctantly, we use the, org, the, the, the donor's blood because it has, its biochemistry is, is favorable for the heart to beat. And we need the heart to beat because if it doesn't, it becomes edematous. And so we, we're going, at this, this very month, we're working on um, trying to uh, replenish, trying to restore the normal biochemistry of, of old stored blood, which, of course, is acidotic, hyperkalemic, and hypocalcemic by design. And we're going to try and normalize that swiftly on the organ care system so that we can actually use stored blood, not the donor's blood. And then, of course, we can, we can, we can go to any donor because then, of course, the, the, it's not such an issue to, to prime the circuit. Sorry, that's rather a full answer. Oh, no, that, that's great. Um, would you mind uh, sharing, Mr. Large, though, just general age of thus far 
Um, what was your youngest DCD heart donor thus far and your oldest? Well, I, I'm, I know our, our oldest of, of late is 18, but Marion will tell me probably there's one a bit younger. It's basically the size no, of the donor. Even. Sorry? 18 is probably the month? youngest. We haven't done it. Yes, we have, there have been none younger than that, yeah. 18 and 57. Yep. yep. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, we have another question, um, and Mr. Large, this was during your presentation. Can you explain the gender disproportion in DCD heart donors that was presented? I think it was 89% male versus 11% female. Yeah. Is there any uh, elaboration yeah. on that? Well, many of the donors we've seen have been um, from hypoxic brain injury, and so much of that has been either from a hanging, from suicide, or from um, IV drug abuse. So uh, it's probably more a reflect, reflection of the of the behavior that brings people to um, to this this peculiar way of diagnosing death, um, rather than any selection on our behalf. And we have no particular we have no gender bias at all. Um, uh, but but that's that's what we believe is is driving that the the gender bias as it seems. Great, great. Um, and maybe a question for you, Marian. Uh, you presented a very impressive stat um, where 100% of the family who you approached for DCD donation also consented for a heart. I believe that was the stat, which is great. Um, yeah. One of the questions was, what, is, what are the common um, questions perhaps asked by families uh, when you did do the approach for DCD heart, um, especially in regards to MPR? Was there any special kind of common questions that would occur, and did you have a special way to, to respond to those questions? Um, I have to confess to having not had to um, to consent a family myself um, for DCD heart donation, um, just because I don't do one call. Um, but reports from, from the specialist nurse teams that, to be quite honest with you, we don't have any um, particular questions from the donor families um, in terms of the consent. They they generally want very little information, um, for, you know, regarding the, pro the procedure and the process. Um, and they just they're just quite happy to consent to donation with fairly you know um the, with with the normal basic information, so there haven't been that many con con would have no concerns raised I think it's worth pointing out that um prior to prior to starting the program, Marion, you did a lot of training on potential questions that might come up oh, yeah. um and uh, and potential answers to them. Um, but you, but in, in reality, as you say, the, the families didn't uh, didn't question it in the way that we thought that they might. We thought right. there might be a lot of questions about, well, if you can start the heart afterwards, why can't you start it in them now, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, that that wasn't the, qu the case. Many of no. them understood the circumstances very well, didn't they? Absolutely, yes. Great, great. And Hedy, just wanted to do a time check. Uh, do we have time for one more question, or, or are we out of time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, wait, there's actually another question in the queue. Okay. A um, couple more. So we have a question that just came in. Um, were any of the DCD heart donors also lung donors? And how would that work with both heart and lung from DCD? The Rather depressingly, um, the, the number of lungs... Um, accepted for, for transplantation has been low, and low before um, the patients are taken to the, to the uh, uh, have, have withdrawal of, of life-supporting therapy. Uh, I'm not sure why that's so. There's, um, there's detail in that, and it's not specifically, we believe, that they're undergoing DCD heart, heart retrieval. We have had two patients who've gone forward for lung transplantation, yeah. um, and that from direct procurement and from normothermic regional perfusion. And so it's a very small experience, but the way we do it is to remove the heart, uh, leaving the lungs, which are a lot more tol tolerable of normothermic um, anoxia than the heart. So uh, we have two teams, one that concentrates on removing the heart uh, by either method, direct procurement or NRP, and then leaving the lungs in place, we put Foley catheters into each of the now opened left and right pulmonary pulmonary arteries to infuse the uh, the uh, pulmonary pulmonary plegia and uh, cool the lungs down and then withdraw the lungs in that way and and, tra and transport them and transplant them in a, a regular way for for lung transplantation 
by hypothermic arrest, by hypothermic storage. Um, we've not started using the, the Transmedics um, normothermic lung perfusion uh, module yet. It's, these, these devices are terribly expensive, and so um, we're a bit restricted on that. So uh, a limited, in answer, a limited experience, but very doable. And the way we get around it is by not injecting into the pulmonary artery um, of the, of the heart-lung block, we've removed the heart and we put folic acid to substitute that um, main pulmonary artery. Great. That does Thank that you, answer your question. Yep. Thank you. TD, I think uh, we're probably uh, out of time for questions, unless you wanted to continue. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually had a, a question as well, um, and uh, that can be answered by whomever <laughs> sees best fit to answer the question. Um, something you presented that is a little bit unusual for us in the U.S. is that um, you will wait for four hours um, or up to four hours in the U.S. typically, and, and maybe uh, this is a lack of clarity on my end in terms of when do those four hours begin? For us, uh, typically the clock starts ticking once extubation occurs. And then um, usually, if we're lucky, the surgeons will stick around to 60 minutes um, and then they will leave. Uh, some might stay on until 90 minutes, if depending on, on the situation and the case. But usually, even before 60 minutes, sometimes the surgeons will uh, not be willing to take the organs. What What is your determining factor if you're waiting four hours? When does that clock start? And then what is your kind of your threshold? What are you looking at in terms of are you looking at your mean arterial pressure? Are you looking at oxygenation? What are you looking at that determines then, oh, no, it's time to shut it down or we can continue to wait? And then how does that translate to the heart? So um, Stephen Large again. Um, what we what we do is to start the clock with withdrawal of supporting life, withdrawing withdrawal of life supporting therapy, and then we um, will lose our liver colleagues when we hit functional warm ischemia. Marin's going to going to correct me on this. Um, they will they will stand by for 30 minutes after functional warm ischemia. Is, is that right, Marin? I think it varies slightly, Stephen, but th between 30 okay. and 60 minutes. Yeah. Six so minutes for they're, yeah, they're pretty swift at leaving, and we historically have been out to four hours, four minutes. Um, but you know that's enthusiasm on our behalf and and anxiety on the on the donor hospital. That's quite a long time to stand by. So at the moment, it's kind of accepted at three hours to stand by, and sort of same sort of time, somewhere between three and four hours for kidney DCD donation, I believe, and Marion will check me on that one. Yes, yeah, three hours generally, okay. four hours in and so, Yeah. What we're, what we're watching for in, that, in those, four hour, those three to four hours is um, the, the blood pressure, the pulse, the oxygenation. And when nothing's really moving, there's probably nothing's going down the way of blood pressure or up in the way of, a heart, uh, of heart rate or indeed profoundly down in the way of a heart rate and, um, and, and no significant deterioration in oxygenation, we, we, tend to, um, we, we tend to leave at three hours. But if there's a trend down in all of those parameters, we'd be encouraged to stay, um, trying desperately not to miss a vital, a vital organ for donation. And um, I feel very strongly that the, the relatives get a huge... Um, uh, um, uh, satisfaction from knowing that some, something good has come out of what is so often a, an absolutely unexpected loss. And so really that's what guides us at the moment. As far as hearts are concerned, I truly believe that it's only when the heart actually stops to, to, that, that the heart is actually rendered hypoxic. And so we've probably got about 30 minutes from that point onwards. That's the kind of working point that is totally different to the colleagues in the liver field where they, they're very nervous when the systolic blood pressure hits 50. When the systolic hit blood pressure hits 50, the diastolic's very low and the heart perfusion's poor. But um, it's a bit like a car running out of fuel, and we, we feel it's all to do with those energy stores. So um, I hope that helps. 
so you d you don't heparinize um, the heart because the vessels are much larger than in in the case of the liver. We uh, we will look for heparinization in um, once we we're not allowed to do pre pre withdrawal uh, in pre pre death pre mortem um, pre diagnosis of death heparinization though the the country is looking very keenly at that and um, I suspect um, that uh, I think all stakeholders will be very keen that we do offer pre pre mortem. Um, heparinization that would be hugely useful, um, and uh, you know it's, it's difficult difficult to describe whether it would or wouldn't have been useful in the relatively small experience we've had had to date. But the feeling is it would be a very a very reassuring way forward. Um, worrying about stasis, it's it, it's, uh, it's of the order of 11 to 12 minutes before in normal thermic region perfusion we get to, we get a circulation going again. Um, but of course in direct perfusion it can be Direct procurement, it can be a little bit longer than that. So the answer is direct, direct procurement, we do not give heparin. Uh, Post-arrest, uh, normal thermic perfusion, as soon as we're open, we've got the neck vessels cross-clamped on the arch of the aorta, we'll give heparin into the pulmonary artery, into the right atrium, and into the pump that will perfuse the, the organs on normal thermic regional perfusion for 25 minutes. Wow. Oh, very fascinating. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for staying on and for your time and, and sharing so much detail and information about the program. I am sure all of the participants have uh, been very fascinated, especially as this is not a practice that we do in the U.S. at this point. And, but I know that there's some research developing in, um, in, in the Boston area as well as in the, in the Seattle area. So. Um, we know that it's coming and um, are very happy that we've been able to learn from you today and thank you for your time. Thank you to all of the participants who stayed on um, this long. And um, so I will be moving the speakers into the speaker room and for all the participants, thank you very much and we wish you a wonderful, day. A wonderful day.